Welcome to another episode of the History Podcast. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word multinational corporation? Is it Google, Amazon, Microsoft, maybe even Apple? Huge companies everyone has encountered. However, these are contemporary associations. Does any corporation older than the second half of the 20th century come to your mind? My guess is probably not. One of the largest and most dominant corporations in history operated long before the technological giants just mentioned. We are talking about the British East India Company. It was not a corporation in today's narrow sense. Of course, it was primarily concerned with multiplying its wealth and investing. The British East India Company, however, was already superior to many countries of the time by the sheer size of its subject territory. Indeed, it was the ruler of large parts of India, which at the time was one of the engines of the world economy. And when, at the end of the 18th century, the company reached the end of its business opportunities, it found a new vocation and began to develop its own empire. At one point, this mega corporation already commanded a private army that consisted of 260,000 soldiers, twice the number of the standing British army. Such a formidable force was more than enough to scare off the remaining competition, conquer almost any territory, and force Indian rulers into the unilateral agreements that gave the company lucrative tax facilities. Without the East India Company, there would be no powerful and wealthy British India. The wild success of the world's first multinational corporation helped shape today's global economy. But how did a company that eventually became more powerful than many countries on the globe at the time come to be in the early 17th century? Well, here we go. To answer the question of how this 17th century global corporation was created out of nothing, we need to go back in time, all the way to 1577. Meet Francis Drake, an English corsair, in 1577 at the behest of Queen Elizabeth. Drake undertook an expedition against Spanish possessions on the west coast of America. This journey evolved into an around-the-world expedition, the second in history, after Ferdinand Magellan's expedition. However, Drake was the first captain to circumnavigate the globe completely. Magellan died during his first expedition. Drake, in December of 1577, set sail from England with more than 150 crew and five ships. The Galleon Pelican, later renamed Golden Hind, as well as the Galleon Elizabeth, the Caravel Marigold, the Caracasuan, and the Meleni. After crossing the Atlantic, two ships had to be abandoned on the east coast of South America, while the other three sailed through the Strait of Magellan all the way to the Pacific. The weather was not favorable. Storms destroyed one ship and made it necessary to turn back the other ones. However, Drake sailed further north along the west coast of South America on the last ship, Golden Hind. Drake deprived the Spanish of an exclusive presence in the Pacific, looting everything he could along the way and capturing Spanish ships and attacking ports. Seeking a northern passage to the Atlantic, Drake sailed all the way to the current US-Canada border. Unable to find the expected connection, he headed south officially taking possession of the English Queen of the California he had discovered there, which he called the New Albion. Drake eventually sailed to the East Indies and reached the Maluku Islands, also known as the Spice Islands. There he met with a Sultan Babula in exchange for flax, gold and silver. He purchased a large amount of exotic spices, including massive bags of cloves and nutmeg. Interestingly, this was a blind purchase to speak. The English did not realize the enormous value of these spices. They only knew that there were no such spices in Europe. After three years of expedition, Drake returned to England in 1580 and became a national hero. 
His circumnavigation of the globe and his gains brought a huge amount of money into England's coffers, with the expedition's investors receiving a return of 5,000%. Thus began something that was an important part of the global political landscape, which in the late 16th century was profit-driven maritime expeditions. Less than 10 years later, after the defeat of the legendary Spanish naval armada, the English took over the excellent and above all huge Spanish and Portuguese ships. These enabled English voyagers to travel the world in search of riches. London merchants after this expedition knew that money was at hand, so they petitioned Queen Elizabeth, asking for permission to sail to the Indian Ocean. The goal was to deal a decisive blow to the Spanish and Portuguese monopoly on trade in the Far East. Queen Elizabeth agreed, and on April 10th, 1591, James Lancaster, commanding the Bonaventure, along with two other ships, set sail from Thorbay and headed south then around the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa and onto the Arabian Sea. After sailing to the Malay Peninsula, he hunted for Spanish and Portuguese ships there before returning to England in 1594 after a three-year expedition. The biggest capture of the time, which definitely boosted English trade, was the seizure of the huge Portuguese carrack Madre da Douche, or Mother of God, done by Sir Walter Raleigh and the Earl of Cumberland. Madre de Douche was captured after the Battle of Flores on August 13, 1592. When the Madre de Douche sailed into the harbour, witnesses were in awe, as it was the largest ship ever seen in England to date, and her cargo consisted of massive chests filled with jewels, pearls, gold, silver, and precious ingredients found in perfume. Cloth, pepper, fragrant cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, as well as dyes of natural origin like carchineal and ebony or precious resin-scented wood. Equally valuable were the ship's logbooks found on board, which contained vital information on trade with China, India and Japan. These unimaginable riches encouraged the English to get involved in this Middle Eastern trade, seemingly inexhaustible in wealth. But how did it happen that India became the object of interest of Western powers? Let's talk a little about this country that is exotic to us. India is a country of contrasts, characterized by great diversity in terms of nature, religion and culture. They awakened the imagination with their vivid colors and intense scent of spices. The first traces of people on the territory of today's India are more than 30,000 years old. West India was conquered first by Persian ruler Darius in 518 BC and in 327 BC by Alexander of Macedon. Subsequently, there were several unifications of Indian territories and again disintegrated into independent kingdoms. In 712, Islam reached India. In the 14th century, almost the entire Indian peninsula came under Muslim rule. This was followed by a renewed disintegration until the country was unified under the rule of the great Mongols. In 1498, India was reached by Vasco da Gama, an empire encompassing almost all of India and part of Central and Eastern Asia was established during Akbar's reign. With time, the subcontinent became an object of interest for the strengthening European powers. All this due to the already mentioned natural advantages of cheap labor. And indeed, after the Drake and Lancaster expeditions, for everyone in England who wanted to quickly multiply their wealth, the goal was to get involved in Middle East, including India. At the same time, it was also clear that individual expeditions, while they could indeed bring huge profits, did not make much sense because of too many risks. Investors had to unite. And so, on September 22nd, 1599, a group of such investors met and jointly expressed and signed their intention to embark on a journey to the East Indies, to the glory and satisfaction of God, so that the country would prosper. Together, a fund of £30,000 was raised. That doesn't seem like much for today's perspective, but converting it to present-day value, it represents more than £4 million.
Two days later, the investors got together again and decided to approach the Queen directly for support in their project. Although their first attempt was not completely successful, they continued to flood the royal court with requests for permission and support for the expedition. They worked all year and came together on December 31st to go to the Queen again to show how determined they were as they bought additional ships for their venture and increased their capital to nearly £70,000, already more than £9 million today. This time it worked. The Queen granted Royal Charter, or Royal Trade Consent, to George Clifford and 215 knights, eldermen and burgesses. The consent authorized the formation of a venture called the Company of London Merchants, trading with the East Indies. In addition, for a period of 15 years, the royal privilege granted the newly formed company a monopoly on English trade with all countries east of the Cape of Good Hope and west of the Straits of Magellan. All other traders who would violate the charter without a license from the company would henceforth require to surrender their ships and cargoes, half of which would go to the British crown and the other half to the company. They also had to face imprisonment for violating the monopoly. And thus was born our corporation. Still small, but with a great appetite for power and money, and very determined to succeed as quick as possible. As befits a corporation, the company immediately set its sights on a clear internal hierarchy. Management of the company was at the hands of one governor. Today we would call him the chairman. He was supported by 24 directors, who made up the court of directors. Today we would call them the board of directors. They, in turn, were answerable to the court of owners and is the equivalent of today's supervisory board. According to tradition, business was initially transacted in a tavern across from St. Bertolf Church in Bishop's Gate before the company acquired a real headquarters, the so-called India House on Leiden Hall Street. And so came the year 1601 when Sir James Lancaster commanded the first voyage of the East India Company aboard the ship Red Dragon. After capturing the gold and spice-filled Portuguese carrack in the Straits of Malacca, the ranks enabled the voyagers to establish two factories, one in the Bantam and the other in the Spice Islands. A factoria is a trading post located in colonial countries. They are usually located on the coast so that the export of raw materials from new areas was as easy as possible. A factoria is, transferring in today's reality, an office building of a foreign corporation erected in another country. Such factories are on the one hand significantly a convenience in the conduct of its affairs, but also a manifestation of its increasing power. Sir Lancaster and his expedition returned to England in 1603, and moments after calling at the port, he learned of the death of Queen Elizabeth I. Fortunately, however, the new King James I was sympathetic to the East India Company. Lancaster was even knighted. Although the war with Spain had ended in the meantime, the company successfully and profitably broke the Spanish and Portuguese Dupoli opening up new commercial horizons for all of England. And from this open horizon, the company took full advantage. In March 1604, Sir Henry Middleton commanded the second voyage to India. General William Killing, a participant in the second voyage in recognition of his service, led the third voyage of the ship Red Dragon in 1607 to 1610. At the beginning of 1608, Alexander Sharpe was appointed captain of the Ascension ship and commander of the fourth expedition. Then both the Ascension and Union ships commanded by Richard Rolls sailed on March 16, 1608. However, this is the first expedition of the company that was lost at sea. And each such expedition represents massive costs, but even greater profits, and with each trip the appetite grew. Initially, the company faced a lot of competition in the spice trade, and their biggest competitor was the Dutch East India Company, 
already well established in the market and the world. So the British could either succumb to the Dutch or go for a direct confrontation. The second option was chosen as you would probably expect and in no time the expansion of the factories began competing with Dutch imports of pepper and java which became an important part of the trade for the next 20 years. So further expansion continued. The high profits recorded by the company after landing in India initially prompted King James I to grant the company a royal charter. Already for an indefinite period with the stipulation, however, that company privileges would be cancelled if trade became unprofitable for three consecutive years. So what were the relations between the British company and other countries and merchants like during these years in the early 17th century? The British company often engaged in hostilities with their Dutch and Portuguese counterparts in the Indian Ocean. After the victory over the Portuguese at the Battle of Suwali in 1612, it was recognized that factories or trading posts were not enough. The East India Company decided to explore the possibility of gaining a real territorial outpost in mainland India, officially recognized for both Britain and the Mongol Empire which demanded that the British crown launch a diplomatic mission. And indeed, in 1612, King James I instructed Sir Thomas Rowe to visit the Mongol ruler Nuruddin Salim Jahangir to conduct a trade agreement. This one would give the company exclusive rights to stay and establish factories in Surat and other areas. In return, they were offered precious goods from the European market. This diplomatic mission was a complete success. Jahangir sent a letter to King James, expressing how enthusiastically the Mongols received the British and the Indian Company. To quote, English King James I, on the basis of the assurance of the favor of your royal love, I have issued a general command to all kingdoms and all ports to accept all merchants of the English nation and all subjects of my friend, your majesty. I declare that the British merchants, in whichever place they may wish to live in, are to be free without any persecution to whatever port they may arrive. Neither Portugal nor anyone else may henceforth harass their tranquility. In whatever city they may reside, I have ordered all my governors and commanders to give them the freedom to suit their own desires, to sell, buy, and transport to their country at will. King, I desire that you send to me your royal letters at every opportunity, so that I may enjoy your health and your prosperity. May our friendship be mutual and everlasting. The favor of the Mongols meant that the next stage of expansion could begin. The company was hungry for more money. Please take a peek at the maps. You will then see with your own eyes how dynamically the organization began to grow and how gigantic the territories were it began to annex. These maps provide a good summary of what followed in no time. India, however, was not the only destination in the interim, for in 1613, during the reign of Tokugawa Haidetada, a British ship named the Clo, commanded by Captain James Saris, became the first British ship to call on Japan. Saris was the commander-in-chief of the company's trading post in the open, and with the help of William Adams, a British sailor who arrived in Japan in 1600, managed to obtain permission from the Japanese ruler for the establishment of a factory in Heradu on the island of Kuyu. The Tokugawa emperor proclaimed, We grant a free license to the subjects of the King of Great Britain, Sir Thomas Smith, Governor and Company of Merchants and Adventurers from the East Indies, to forever safely arrive at each of our ports, our Empire of Japan, with their ships and goods, without any hindrance to them or their goods. We give permission to stay, buy, sell and trade in their own way with all nations, staying here as long as they deem it good and leaving at their own discretion. 
Unfortunately, the Japanese put tough trade conditions, unable to obtain Japanese raw silk for import to China while having a trade area limited to only Heradu and Nagasaki. The company, however, closed its Japanese branch in 1623. It's a small stumble, and the company continues to expand its trading activities. Soon, the company's trade balance surpassed that of Portugal's Estadu de India. Moreover, Portugal later gave the Bombay to England as part of the dowry Catherine of Braganza brought to her marriage to King Charles II. The British set up trading posts in Surat, Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. By 1647, the company, which was not yet 50 years old at the time, had already established 23 factories, each under the command of a master merchant and governor. At the same time, it already had 90 of its employees in India alone. The main factories became the Walled Fort William in Bengal, Fort St. George in Madras and the Bombay Castle. In 1634, the Mongol Emperor invited English merchants to the Bengal region and later completely abolished the duty for their trade. The basis of the company's business at the time was cotton silk, indigo dye, saltpeter and tea. The competition, meanwhile, struggled with diminished Portuguese and Spanish influence in the region. The British and Dutch company, the two remaining players, entered a period of intense co-rivalry. The Dutch were a formidable opponent at the time. During the first two decades of the 17th century, the Dutch East India Company was the richest trading operation in the world employing 50,000 workers, also having a fleet of 200 ships, specializing in the spice trade and paying its shareholders a 40% annual dividend. The British company, although efficiently managed, was really tiny in comparison. The British company competed fiercely with the Dutch and French for spices from the Spice Islands. At the time, spice valued in Europe could only be found in the islands. We are talking about specialities such as pepper, ginger, nutmeg, cloves and cinnamon. Bringing them to Europe yielded profits of 400% from just one trip. As a result, the growing tension between the Dutch and British trading companies became so great that it escalated into four Anglo-Dutch wars. And despite these wars, the situation continued to be a stalemate, with the Dutch unwilling to let go. At the same time, the company reported to the king that the lack of progress was made due to the fact that the decision-making process was too long. The company had to wait too long for a royal decision in order to effectively fight the competition in India. And that victory in India would, after all, mean increasing profits, including for the king. The king therefore had no choice, for passivity would have meant defeat, and in 1670, he decided to strengthen the company, and in no small measure. He granted the British company the right to autonomous territorial acquisitions, mint its coin, command fortresses and armies, make alliances, war and peace, and exercise civil and criminal jurisdiction over the acquired territories. And this was the moment when the British East India Company de facto became an independent and on top of that, a truly powerful entity on the international stage. Imagine any of today's corporations getting such powers. Inconceivable, yet this is what happened a mere 350 years ago. However, let's return to England for a moment. Soon, the prosperity enjoyed by the company's officers allowed them to return to Britain and establish extensive residences and businesses, and as respected businessmen, gained political power. The company was beginning to develop its lobby in the English Parliament. However, under pressure from other competing merchants, as well as former company associates who wanted to set up their own private trading companies in India, the Deregulation Act was passed in 1694, 
This allowed any English company to trade with India without special permission. This was a very different approach from the agreement that had been a place in England for the past 100 years. In theory, it was intended to allow competition for the British East India Company, which was co-sponsored by the state. However, the company's members were one step ahead of Parliament. Moments after the introduction of the new Liberal Law, a new parallel East India Company was established, officially titled English Company Trading of the East Indies. It was promptly listed on the stock exchange with a financial guarantee of £2 million. The powerful shareholders of the previous company quickly bought up the shares in the new East India Company and thus dominated this new company. The two companies, for a while as if for show, fought each other in both England and India for a dominant share of trade. However, it soon became clear that they were in fact the same company, and so the two companies merged in 1708. And thus rose an even more powerful player, a player that, although it bore the old name of the British East India Company, in fact once again showed its cunning to control the situation. The British Crown formed an agreement with the company. As part of this agreement, the combined companies lent the Treasury the sum of £3 million in exchange for exclusive trading privileges for the next three years, after which the situation was to be reviewed anew. At this point, we need to have a good understanding of what just happened. This company, initially founded by a few ingenious merchants, had become so powerful that it had pushed through favorable changes in the law. At the same time, it is so rich that it has the state that is indebted to them, and all this in less than 100 years. Unbelievable. And yet, in the decades that followed, there was a constant battle between the company's lobby and parliament. The company sought a permanent seat, but this would have meant even more autonomy. And Parliament was no longer willing to accept this. By 1720, 15% of British imports came from India. Almost all of it went through the company, and this strengthened its influence in Parliament. Permission to trade for the company was therefore extended until 1766. Meanwhile, Britain and France became fierce rivals. There were frequent battles between them over control of colonial possessions. In turn, this was a constant cost of repairing and building ships. Training the army, the British crown began to run out of money again. Therefore, in 1742, fearing the monetary consequences of the war, the British government agreed to extend the company's exclusive trading license in India in exchange for another loan to England of £1 million, a loan that the company, of course, had bankrolled. It seemed that the legal and organisational tussle between the company and the British Crown would last forever. Then the Seven Years' War, which had been growing for many years, broke out. It was a war between Great Britain, Prussia and Hanover, and France, Austria, as well as Russia, Sweden and Saxony. It was a war of global scope. Fighting took place in Europe, North America, India and the Caribbean islands. In a later phase of the conflict, Spain and Portugal joined the Seven Years' War, including the Netherlands, which initially tried to remain neutral and whose forces were attacked in India. The Seven Years' War involved most of the world powers of the time. The war was also marked by a decisive phase in the Franco-British struggle for dominance in North America, which lasted nearly 100 years. The war was characterized by sieges and arson of cities, but also by battles on the open field with extremely heavy losses. It is estimated that the Seven Years' War claimed nearly one and a half million victims. And it was the Seven Years' War that turned England's attention to consolidating and defending territorial possessions in Europe and the colonies. For this war was also fought in Indian territory between the company's troops fighting on behalf of Britain and French forces. Lands in India were at stake there, and so we come to another ingenious company fortune. 
Although in 1757 the fate of the war was not yet decided, by then British Crown officials had already issued a legal opinion known as Pratt York. This was an outstanding legal work, arguing and justifying why a distinction should be made between overseas territories acquired under the law of conquest and those acquired by treaty or other agreement. The Pratt York opinion stated that although the British Crown had the right to sovereignty over the lands purchased by the company, ownership of the conquered lands was vested in those who conquered it, namely the East India Company. This opinion, although issued by the British Crown, was very favorable for the company's eventual victory in the war with France. But why such a favorable view? The solution is simple. One of the authors of the legal opinion previously worked as a lawyer of Compania. The Seven Years' War had to be won, and indeed it was coming to an end, but the last chord of this war was the Battle of Palassi. The Battle of Palassi was a decisive victory for the British East India Company over the much larger forces of the Nawab of Bengal and his French allies. The battle took place on June 23, 1757. The victory of the British Company was the beginning of almost two centuries of British rule in India. For an event of such momentous consequences, the battle was surprisingly unimpressive from a military perspective. For that, it had treachery in the background. How did this happen? In 1755, Siraj Dula Alouach became a Nawab and adopted the French policy. Nawab is the title of a Muslim prince in India, especially in Bengal, meaning a rich man. The title of Nawab was given by Mongol rulers to the governors of Bengal. While it is also a historical land in South Asia, in the eastern part of the Hindustani plain on the Bay of Bengal. The western part of Bengal is in India and the eastern part is Bangladesh. Siraj Dula Aluach, in alliance with France, invaded British trading posts, including Calcutta, where he left British prisoners to die in overcrowded jails. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cliff was sent to Madras to recapture Calcutta for Britain, and from there began planning the overthrow of the Nawab. One of the Nawab's disgruntled supporters, Mir Jafar, was secretly bribed with the promise of thrones if he would support the dig. Other Bengali generals were also subjugated, and this gave the British a much-needed advantage. On June 23, 1757, Cliff moved on the Bengali capital Murshidabad and faced the Nawab army. The disparity of forces seemed insurmountable. Nawab's army numbered 50,000 soldiers. Two-thirds of its infantry were armed with muskets. The French additionally sent artillery men to reinforce the Nawab with 50 cannons, while the British had 3,000 infantry men. The British artillery opened fire first, followed by the Bengal guns. The British guns returned fire due to the proximity of the Bengal cavalry to the French guns. The bombardment from the cliff guns did not hit the Bengal artillery, but caused damage to the cavalry, which forced the Nawab to withdraw. When the Nawab infantry advanced, the cliff field guns opened fire with cartridges, along with waves of fire from the infantry muskets and the Bengal troops were stopped. That's when traitors from about a third of the Bengal army did not join the fight, despite the Nawab's pleas and were isolated on one flank. Despite Jafar's betrayal, the situation was still not good for Cliff. However, that's when the rain began to fall. Cliff had a tarp with him, which was immediately stretched over the dust to protect it from the moisture. The Bengalis, however, had no such protection. After several minutes of heavy rainfall, thinking that the British guns were as incapable of firing because of the wet gunpowder as his own, Nawab ordered his artillery to make an all-out charge. However, British guns opened fire and slaughtered hundreds of cavalry men, also killing the commander of the Mir Madaj Khan. The Nawab panicked at the loss of such a valuable general and ordered his forces to withdraw, exposing the French artillery contingent. The British then stormed forward. After seizing the French cannons, they bombarded the Nawab's positions and the fortunes of the battle were reserved. The Nawab fled the battlefield and Jafar, 
the one who betrayed Nawab, was put in power as British governor as a reward. The victory cost the lives of only 22 soldiers on the British side, while giving a giant step toward British control of Bengal. As a result of the battle, the French ceased to be a significant force in Bengal. The British-French struggle for dominance continued, although nothing could threaten the British victory anymore. In 1763, the Peace of Paris, a treaty between Britain, France and Spain was signed. This treaty ended the Seven Years' War and confirmed Britain's devastating victory over France and Spain. The most important provisions of the treaty, however, confirmed Britain's seizure of most of the territories of the French colonial empire, created between the 17th and 18th centuries. The British colonial empire included non-European possessions and the sovereignty of the seas, which became the basis of British supremacy on a global scale. However, a problem remained. While according to the treaties, the territories of India, Bangladesh and adjacent areas belong to Britain. In fact, the indigenous peoples and Mongols ruled there. These, in turn, were reluctant to agree to exchange the French for the English. For them, this was a purely nominal change, for they would continue to be dependent on the overseas power. So more fighting ensued. One might say independence battles. This time, the English did not fight the French, but the indigenous Indian and Muslim population. And the climax of these battles was the Battle of Baksa. The clash took place on October 22, 1764, between the forces of the British East India Company on the one hand and the combined armies of Mirka Sim, a Nawab from Bengal, Suja ud Daula, Nawab Avadu, and Al Magri II, a Mongol emperor. The Battle of Baksa took place near the town of Baksa precisely, which lay on the banks of the Ganges. This was a decisive victory for the British company, as after the Battle of Baksa, the Nawabs lost their military strength. The lack of basic coordination between these three different allies was responsible for their decisive defeat. The British victory at Baksa destroyed in one fell swoop the three main descendants of the Mongol powers. The entire Ganges Valley was henceforth at the mercy of the company. The result of this battle was the imposition of the Divani Law. This law handed over to the company the administration of tax matters and the management of revenues in the vast areas that now constituted the Indian states of West Bengal, Bahir and Uttar Pradesh. The Battle of Baksar marks the beginning of the rule of the British East India Company in this entire part of the Indian subcontinent. And it is from this moment that we can speak of the birth of the true ruthlessness and unlimited power of the British Company, which 150 years earlier did not even exist. Thus ended the stage of armed struggle and conquest of rivals. As early as 1793, the Nizamat, or local authority, was abolished by the Nawab Company. The previous chieftains in the territories were forcibly retired, paid, by the way, from the company's budget. The expansion of power has since taken mainly two forms. The first was simply the gradual annexation of more Indian states, followed by direct management of the underlying regions. These, in turn, collectively included British India. This method was used for small, poor areas, since they did not have the possibility of any resistance, to put it simply. The company would enter the area with its army and declare that from now on, these areas belong to it. The second form of assuring power was through treaties, in which the rulers of a given piece of Indian territory recognized the company's authority in exchange for being left with limited internal autonomy. This method was used for the richer regions. This is because they paid a significant tax to the company, but in fact, partial autonomy was left in their hands. This was a win-win situation in the early 19th century. Such territories accounted for two-thirds of India. The company preferred this method, 
It was a method of direct rule that did not involve the economic costs of direct administration, nor the political costs of gaining and maintaining support. The larger the territory, the more difficult it is to manage. So, how do you manage territories the size of today's India? I invite you behind the corporate scenes of the East India Company. Until the Palasi victory, the East India Company's territories in India, those that consisted mainly of the presidential cities, Calcutta, Madras and Bombay, were governed by mostly autonomous and thus rebel-prone city councillors. These, in turn, were composed of local merchants. City councillors had barely enough resources to effectively manage their local affairs, let alone those imposed by the company. The resulting lack of oversight of all of the company's activities led to many serious abuses and fostered either corruption or turning a blind eye to problems. The Palasi victory and its aftermath quickly brought India into the British spotlight. The British Crown realized that the company was a giant that, in time, might forget with those whose permission it was created in the first place. The company's money management practices thus began to be questioned, such as the fact that the company was showing net losses on paper, while every so often some of the company's employees were returning to the UK with huge fortunes. War is always a giant cost, and after the Seven Years' War, the company needed government loans to maintain its existence in London. But it was feared that supporting a company that is openly suspected of financial embezzlement would result in a subsequent collapse of trust in the state. Therefore, the British Parliament made several inquiries, and in 1773, during Lord North's tenure, the Regulatory Act was passed. This constituted regulations in order to better manage the affairs of the East India Company in India as in Europe. Although Lord North himself wanted the company's territories to be simply overtaken by the state, he encountered strong political opposition from many quarters, including the City of London and the British Parliament. The dispute was fierce, and the final result had to be a compromise. So, from then on, the company's court of directors, or the company's board of supervisors, was required to submit all communications concerning civil, military and treasury matters for examination by the British government. It also appointed a British governor-general, which was Warren Hastings. Four councillors were also assigned to administer the British Bengal presidency, which was described as overarching and most important. They were to oversee on the ground how the company was doing and whether it was exceeding its authority in the first place. The following provision was also added to the law. Subordinate company presidencies are prohibited from waging war or entering into territories without the prior approval of the Governor-General of Bengal. The exception is when it is an unavoidable necessity and it is with this precisely worded provision of unavoidable necessity that left the door open for various interpretations. The Regulatory Act also attempted to address widespread corruption in India. Company employees were henceforth forbidden to engage in private commerce in India or to receive so-called gifts from Indian citizens. Around the same time, there was a wide-ranging debate in the British Parliament on the issue of Bengal land rights. The consensus leaned toward the view promoted by Philip Francis, a political opponent of Warren Hastings. Francis believed that all Bengal lands should be considered the property and inheritance of indigenous landowners and their families. Meanwhile, in the background of this discussion, another one began among the merchants in London, saying that the monopoly granted to the company in 1600, a monopoly which at this point was already more than 170 years old, was intended to make it easier for the company to compete with the Dutch and French, should have already been repelled. After all, the situation had changed drastically. And in fact, in the Charter Act of 1813, 
the British Parliament, although it renewed the company's status, took away its monopoly, except for that on the tea trade and trade with China in general. This decision opened India to both private investment and religious missionaries. So let's summarize after a series of victories. The conditions in which the company now had to operate were increasingly difficult. On the one hand, it no longer had a local adversary in Indian territory by road. But on the other hand, it had a very strong oversight by the British crown over itself. And while the king had once stoked the company's embers, there was now a panicky effort to extinguish the flame into which the company had transformed itself. At that time, basically, all of Bengal was under the company's control. This meant that any further conquests were impossible without the approval of the British crown, and this was already unrealistic. So to make the most of what the company already had at its disposal, they began to do what the company did best, improving the flow of money and increasing efficiency of operations, and the room for improvement here was considerable. The company, while taking control of Indian lands and at the same time inherited, as it were, the traditional system of revenue collection in this system. The largest part of the tax burden fell on farmers, and one third of the agricultural production was reserved for the state. This was a pre-colonial system and began the basis of the company's revenue policy. However, there were huge differences in India's methods of collecting, counting and remitting revenue. This in turn meant additional time spent counting and checking and gave the possibility that income might just escape somewhere. Driven by the need for unification, the district committee visited the districts of the Bengal presidency, as it were, with an audit and concluded a five-year tax agreement. New rules for taxation of Indian territories were introduced. It was decided that a simple lump sum on a given piece of land had to be paid to the company through local councils at a fixed amount. It was expected that the knowledge of a fixed fiscal burden would encourage farmers to increase production efficiently. After all, if some began to produce more goods from a given piece of land, the surplus was at their disposal. In addition, it was expected that land itself would become a transferable, willing form of property that could be bought, sold or mortgaged. However, these expectations did not materialize, and forced labor began to be used in many areas of Bengal just to meet the tax requirements. This is because these requirements did not take into account factors other than fiscal. Weather conditions, for example, did not matter. If the harvest failed further, a fixed amount of tax had to be paid. Local Indian administrators were often unable to meet the increased demands placed on them by the company. As a result, many defaulted, and it was estimated at the time that up to one-third of the land was sold at auction in the first three decades after the system was introduced. But who might be willing to buy land that just a short while ago bankrupted the previous owner? Well, the new owners were often employees of the company who understood the new tax system well and were able to manage. And that's how the company, with white gloves, came out ahead again. Growing territory is an increasing urgent need to keep it under control. So, let's talk about the company's army and military. In 1772, when Warren Hastings became the first Governor General, one of his first undertakings was to rapidly expand the army. By 1796, the company already had 70,000 soldiers, and of these, 57,000 were Indians. The Bengal army, one of the third largest armies of the British, being of course under the company's administration, was henceforth used in military campaigns throughout India and abroad. For example, in the Cylon. Unlike the soldiers in the armies of the Indian rulers, the company's sepoys not only received a high salary, but also received it on time and in full, which was definitely not the rule in those days. Soon reinforced by both new musket technology and naval support, the Bengal army became widely respected and revered 
dressed in red coats. In the open, the Sepoys were considered the embodiment of demonic forces and sometimes even ancient heroes. At the beginning of the 19th century, the combined strength of the armies of the three presidencies of Bengal, Madras and Bombay was already 154,000 men. This meant that the British East India Company then had one of the largest armies in the world and was further strengthening it. Let's talk about how the English approached Indian culture, which is so distant and different from European culture. The original policy of the company was Orientalism, that is, adapting to the lifestyle and customs of the Indians, rather than trying to reform them. The assumption at the time was that the Indian culture should be respected, and Indians would reciprocate with obedience in return. This attitude changed, however, after 1813, when reformist forces in the homeland, particularly evangelic religion and utilitarian philosophy, caused the East India Company to act as an ambassador for the British modern way of life. And this meant an inevitable intrusion into Indian culture. Hindus were banned from the brutal custom of sati, or burning of a widow after her husband's death, and began prosecuting clucks or ritual killers out of hand. The social status of women was also raised. Schools were being established to teach English. Following a period of prosperity after heavy military spending, the company had little money to engage in extensive public works projects or modernization programs. Therefore, they began to impose their Western culture on Indians, while public spending was severely curtailed. Speaking of spending, let's discuss the local economy of the East India Company at the time. As late as the 1850s, India's exports to the markets of Europe, Asia and Africa were mostly precious cotton and silk cloth, which was material already processed and ready to use as sewing. By the second quarter of the 19th century, unprocessed raw cotton, opium and indigo dye were being exported. This was due to the high demand in the world for these raw materials. This prompted many farmers in India to switch to growing cotton as a very profitable crop. At this time, East India trade with China also began to develop. In the early 19th century in Britain, the demand for Chinese tea increased significantly. The company obviously wanted to buy the tea and ship it profitably to Britain. However, the Chinese wanted payment for their goods. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, the money supply in India was limited and the company could not import palpable bullion like gold and silver from Britain without restrictions. So they decided to trade barter for tea from China in exchange for Indian opium, which was strictly rationed in China. And at the same time, it was produced in many parts of India. Opium is a substance obtained by dyeing the milky sap of immature poppy seeds and was mainly used as a painkiller, but also as a sedative, sleeping aid and intoxicant in the form of an alcoholic extract called laudanum. Opium was also smoked and made it a highly desirable commodity for the Chinese, as it was easy to feed the black narcotics market. Soon, however, seeing that Indo-Chinese trade began to rely solely on opium payments, Chinese authorities banned the import and consumption of Indian opium. This began the first opium war, and after its conclusion by treaty, the company gained access to five Chinese ports, Gangzhou, Xiamen, Fosu, Shanghai, and Ningbo. In addition, Hong Kong was ceded to the British crown. By the end of the second quarter of the 19th century, opium exports already counted for 40% of India's exports. Another important export product, though unusual from today's point of view, was the aforementioned indigo dye. This is extracted from the natural leaves of the tropical indigo plant found in India. In Europe in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, blue clothing was in fashion and blue uniforms were common in the military. 
As a result, the demand of indigo dye was very high. This demand was unstable, however, and the market collapsed both in 1827 and 20 years later in 1847. The company heavily interfered with the legal system in place on existing Indian lands. Until the British took control of Bengal in the mid-18th century, the local judiciary was presided over by the Nawab of Bengal himself, who, as the chief legal official known as the Nawab Nazim, handled cases that qualified for the death penalty. His deputy, Naib Nazim, handled somewhat less important cases. Ordinary court trials, on the other hand, were under the jurisdiction of local court officials. In rural areas called Mufusilas of Authority, the administration of justice was carried out by zamindars, or village heads, with hereditary rights to collect rents. They did this hastily and did not even have to be specifically accountable to anyone. Until after the execution of the death penalty, then it had to be reported to the Nawab in advance. This arrangement, of course, urgently needed to be changed in the charter granted by Charles of the Second Company. In 1683, powers were granted to establish local courts of jurisdiction in places of their choosing, each court consisting of a lawyer, the company, and two of its merchants. Thus, the Bengali judiciary was completely dominated. The British East India Company expected to remain in India for centuries. So, such a mundane yet forward-looking issue as educating future Indian generations was addressed. This was motivated by fears among some officials of the company being seen as foreign rulers. At the time, there was also a belief among the company's employees that they would become better stewards if they were better versed in Indian languages and cultures. Proponents of this approach were called Orientalists. This led to the founding of the College of Fort William in Calcutta in 1800. The group of Orientalists was headed by Horrells Hallam Wilson and many of the company's top officials, such as Thomas Munro and Mount Stuart Elphinstone was influenced by Orientalism. It was the ethos of Orientalism that dominated educational policy as late as the 1920s. Soon after, however, Orientalists were opposed to proponents of a new approach called Anglicism. It's a decidedly more culturally aggressive approach. The Anglicists advocated teaching in English in order to impart to the Indians what they considered to be modern, adequate, and best Western knowledge. Among them were evangelicals, who in 1813, when company lands were opened to Christian missionaries, were interested in spreading the Christian faith. They also believed in using theology to promote liberal social reforms, such as the abolishment of slavery. Among the Angelicists was Charles Grant himself, then president of the East India Company. The Utilitarians, led by James Miller, emerged from the Anglicists, who began to play an important role in shaping the company's policies. The Utilitarians believed in the moral value of education, which helps the good of society and promotes the teaching of useful knowledge, in turn, this approach meant that the more educated an individual was, the more he or she could help the interests of the company. At the same time, however, an individual who is not very educated represents little or sometimes even zero value. As English was increasingly used, Persian was soon abolished as the official language of the administration and courts. From 1852 to 1853, some citizens of Bombay sent a petition to the British Parliament demanding the establishment of higher education in India. And interestingly enough, they did. From the middle of the 19th century, universities began to establish under the custody of the East India Company, the University of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. In between the educational reforms, there were also social reforms. In the first half of the 19th century, the British introduced reforms against what they considered to be wicked Indian practices. 
for example, Hindu society from the upper classes had long viewed the remarriage of widows with great suspicion. They wanted to protect what they considered family honor as well as property. Widows were expected to lead a life of renunciation and modesty, even many years after their husband's death. The company therefore introduced the Hindu Widow Remarriage Act in 1856. It provided a legal safeguard against the loss of inheritance. After the remarriage of a Hindu woman, however, very few widows actually remarried. This was the result of the company wanting to change a centuries-old tradition with a single decision. Some reforms wanted to change Hindu society as quickly as possible, even offered money to men to take widows as brides. These men, however, often left their new wives as soon as they took the money. The company in its subordinate territories introduced technological innovations. It is worth mentioning such a mundane thing from today's perspective, but so modern in the past as postal and shipping services, as well as telegraph lines. Prior to 1837, there was no universal public postal service in India that was common to all regions. Although parcel services did exist, connecting major cities with provincial government headquarters, the average Indian had no means of using them. This situation changed in 1837 when a public postal service was opened in India under the company. Subsequently, post offices were established in major cities and a state post office was established. Postal services required payment in cash in advance, with the amount charged varying according to weight and distance. For example, the fee for sending a letter from Calcutta to Mumbai was one rupee. As the distance increased, the rate rose. The Indian Post Office began delivering letters, newspapers, postcards, books and parcels. The number of these deliveries steadily increased until 1861. A total of nearly 900 post offices were opened and nearly 43 million letters and more than 4.5 million newspapers were delivered annually. To effectively manage such a large corporation, you need a medium faster than letters. Today, we have emails, text messages, and instant messaging. At the time, however, the real innovation was telegraphic contact, which is almost instantaneous. It was groundbreaking for the time, just as the introduction of fiber optics in the 20th century was as groundbreaking, albeit very expensive. However, back in 1820 to 1830, the company's board of directors seriously considered building telegraph towers, each 30 meters high and 14 kilometers from the next, all the way from Calcutta to Bombay. However, it wasn't until the middle of the century that widespread electric telegraphy became viable. That's when scientists at the Medical College of Calcutta were given permission to run a trial telegraph service from Calcutta to Diamond Harbor along the rivers. A year later, it was successful, and the company asked for permission to build telegraph lines from Calcutta to Agra, then on to Bombay, and then on to Madras. These lines stretched over 3,000 miles and included 41 stations. Such permission was already granted by 1855. All the proposed telegraph lines were built and began to be used to send toll messages. The fee for using the telegraph was set at one rupee for every 16 words. So let's summarize. On the one hand, the company developed technology and modernized the territories under its authority. On the other hand, it pursued an increasingly aggressive cultural policy and noticeably worse treatment of the original inhabitants of these lands. So we come slowly to the year 1857. It was then that the British East India Company, a powerful corporation with its own army, land and the right to declare wars, suddenly collapsed. Although theoretically the cause was a revolution, its downfall came from a combination of minor factors. Listen to this Sepoy's uprising that dealt the East India Company a blow so powerful that it ended its existence.
Sepoys, as you will remember, were Indian soldiers who were recruited into the company's army just before the uprising itself. There were more than 300,000 in the army compared to 50,000 British. As you will recall, in 1772, when Warren Hastings became India's first Governor General, one of his first undertakings was to rapidly expand the army because the Sepoys of Bengal, many of whom had fought against the company at the battles of Palassi and Baksar, were suspect in the eyes of the British. It was Hastings who recruited further west. This, in turn, meant recruitment among the higher classes, who did not want to serve with the lower classes in the same army. To prevent social friction, the company took steps to adapt the usual military practices to the requirements and customs of society. As a result, the army was divided. Soldiers of higher classes ate their dinners in separate establishments. In addition, they were not required to serve abroad, which was considered polluting to the higher classes. However, over time, the company occupied more territories, and this meant that Indian soldiers were now expected to serve in lesser-known regions, such as Burma. At the same time, due to the rising costs of maintaining an ever-growing army, the payment of sepoys for overseas service was abandoned. This in turn coincided with a change in the law regarding service overseas. New recruits could already be sent on naval deployments, and these always meant months of separation from family and home. As if this were not enough, the company's fatal mistake was the introduction of the Enfield M18 53mm rifle into service among the Sepoys. This rifle had a modern narrow barrel, and this meant that the cartridges had to be pre-greased so that they would not be bogged down when fired. The Enfield used such cartridges which were coated with paper soaked in grease before use, according to rumors popular among the Sepoys. This fat was of animal origin, either pig or cow. Cows are sacred animals for Hindus, while for Muslims pigs are unclean. To use these cartridges laced with paper soaked in such grease, soldiers had to bite off the cap of the paper cartridge before firing. This was a severe violation of religious regulations. Rumors began to spread that the British wanted to destroy the culture and religion of Hindus by subterfuge. And yet, given the company's previous culturally aggressive actions, these were not unfounded suspicions. Wanting to urgently salvage the situation, on January 27, 1857, Colonel Richard Berg ordered that all cartridges used from magazines be free of grease and that the Sepoys could lubricate it themselves using any mixture at their discretion. This, however, only led many Sepoys to believe that the rumors were true and that their fears were justified. In addition, there were new rumors that the paper in the new cartridges, which was glazed and stiffer than the paper previously used, was impregnated with grease anyway. More and more sepoys alleged that when thrown into the fire, the paper smelt of animal fat. The military was followed by unrest among civilians. Indian nobles wanted to get rid of the company as they felt the company interfered too much with the traditional system of inheritance. This group included future rebel leaders such as Nana Sahib and Ranis Hajhansi. The second group, known as Talugdas, or small landowners, lost half of their estates due to the company's land reforms. They too were fed up with the English. It also came to light that the company's judicial system was inherently unfair to Indians. It turned out that company officials were allowed an endless series of appeals, while natives could appeal an unsatisfactory verdict only once, which caused further civil unrest. Discontent was already widespread, but one final impulse was needed that would set off the entire machinery of the uprising, which appeared at the end of March 1857. It was then that a certain sepoy named Mangal Pandi fed up with the rumors of suspicion, with the prospect of years of service overseas and most likely death, decided that he had nothing left to lose. However, he can use his life as a symbol with a raised brow. So, with his gun in hand, 
he single-handedly attacked British officers in the military garrison in Barak. He was immediately arrested and then executed by the British in early April. This made Pandey a martyr, but who is still treated as a national hero in India today. The hanging of Mangal Pandey set off a series of events. A few days later, the Mikrat Sapoys refused to accept cartridges for the Enfield rifle and were sentenced to long prison sentences as punishment, bound in chains and thrown into dungeons. This too made them martyrs and their fellow insurgents on May 10th executed their British officers and marched directly to the Delhi, where there were no European troops at the time, only Sapoy contingents. In the Delhi, the local Sepoy's garrison joined the insurgents, and at dusk the retired Mongol Emperor Bahadur Tashar II was supposedly restored to power. The seizure of the Delhi gave fuel to the entire revolt. The mood was euphoric, and the end of the British oppression was coming. The Sepoy's insurgency quickly spread to most of northern India in about two weeks, and at that point it became clear that the company's army model, while very economically efficient, was insanely dangerous to itself. As you know, the vast majority of the company's army were Sepoy's, and it was at the time of the uprising that more than 230,000 Sepoy's stood up against a mere 45,000 Englishmen. Command of the insurgents was taken by Nana Sahib among the important urban centers. The Delias was seized with the support of civilians. Lucknow and Kampur were also besieged. Resistance against the English was not universal, however, as those in suppressing the Sepoy's uprising were supported by local Indian princes interested in maintaining their power, as well as the King of Nepal himself. After drawing reinforcements from the Middle East and other major cities, the British began suppressing the uprising, starting with the Punjabu. At stake was regaining control of India, and thus the continued existence of this very important part of the British Empire. This was the moment when the insurgency began to collapse. The Sepoy uprising was a very brutal period in Indian history. Although major battles did not happen much, the civilian population suffered unprecedented torment in between. The company's actions were in retaliation according to some estimates. 150,000 Indians were killed in the Kampur, of which 100,000 were civilians. The capture of each major city was followed by numerous massacres. Violence fueled each other from both sides. There were times when the Sepoys killed British women, children and wounded soldiers. The British in turn began to use cannon fire. This was a very cruel punishment of convicted rebels. They were tied with their backs to the barrel of a cannon and when a bullet was fired, it ripped the unfortunate man to shreds. The abuse involved forcing many Muslims or Hindu rebels to eat pork or beef. Torture practices included burning with hot irons, immersion in wells and rivers until drowned, castration and hanging from tree branches. In one witness account we read, When the English defeated the enemy, they captured 140 men, women and children and selected 60 men from the group. They forced them to build themselves a gallows from wooden logs gathered from burning houses. Then they selected 10 men from the group and hanged them without any evidence and no trial. They punished the others with flogging and beating to teach a lesson. On another occasion in one village, some 2,000 villagers armed with only wooden sticks rose up in peaceful protest to confront the British. In turn, the latter surrounded them and set fire to the village. The Sepoy's uprising lasted two long years of bleeding out and successive destruction of what the company had managed to achieve over 100 years. First, there were desperate battles in the Delhi, then operations around Lucknow in the winter of 1857. Finally, the Sir Hugh Rossa campaign in early 1858 brought peace and a truce was declared on July 8, 1859. The uprising was crushed, 
However, the two-year struggle was much more than the British Crown could understand. It was something that could not be diplomatically presented to Parliament for evaluation. The myth of the East India Company, reigning indivisibly over the entire Indian continent, was irretrievably lost. The British leadership and politicians harshly condemned the company at their opponents, who had fought against its uncontrolled expansion for two centuries, were heard. In a wave of outrage at reports of what atrocities were happening in India, the final option was pushed through under the provisions of the Government of India Act 1858. The British government nationalized the company, took over the company's Indian possessions and its administrative powers, machinery and all armed forces. It was an annihilation and no one expected such a drastic step to occur. It is simply inconceivable from today's perspective, and yet it happened. At that point, the East India Company was so illegally elaborate that the debts and obligations it issued continued after its dissolution and were only extinguished by the British government during World War II. From then on, in 1859, the company only continued to manage the tea trade on behalf of the British government. On January 1st, 1874, the annual meeting of the company shareholders was held for the last time. A gloomy, sad atmosphere prevailed. The last dividend was paid, and finally, a resolution was voted to end the British East India Company. And so ended the formal and actual existence of this corporation. A year later, the Times wrote, the British East India Company has achieved more than any company in human history. It is highly doubtful that any company will ever be able to surpass the size of the company's achievements. And what were the effects of the company's collapse in India? First of all, the beginning of a policy of understanding and mutual consultation with Indians and local representatives began to be appointed to state bodies, rather than exclusively British. Educational programs and public works, such as roads, railways and irrigation, were intensified. The failed insurgency had an impact on the Indian people themselves. Traditional, heavily class-based Indian society was unable to realistically unite. The princes and other high-born individuals either stayed away from the rebellion or mostly proved incompetent. The collapse of the Sepoys uprising marked the collapse of hope for a revival of Indian independence in the kind of social shape it once was. The traditional structure of Indian society began to crumble and was eventually replaced by the Western class and cultural system. In 1858, the British government took control of the territories and the treaty arrangements of the former East India Company. In 1876, the area that included present-day India, Pakistan and Bangladesh became the Indian Empire. The British Indian Army was established and subsequently helped Britain in many wars, including both world wars. After the uprising, the Indian independence movement was gaining ground, with a steadily growing opposition to British rule, both through active uprisings and through passive resistance, best exemplified by the figure of Gandhi himself. This resistance accumulated and eventually led to Indian independence in 1947. The government of India celebrated 2007 as the 150th anniversary of India's first war of independence. At that time, a group of retired British soldiers and civilian descendants of British soldiers who died during the uprising tried to take part in the celebrations. However, overwhelming fears of riots and civil unrest backed by the Hindu Nationalist Party prevented them from attending, despite their protests. Sir Mark Havelock managed to break through the police and visit the grave of his ancestor, General Henry Havelock. Although the British East India Company dissolved more than 150 years ago, to this day everyone still feels the fact that it once existed 
and operated as a pioneer of corporatism. The company shaped the way that business is conducted today in the global economy. It's difficult to understand today's geopolitics without understanding the company's role at the time. It's doubtful that today's capitalist economy system would look the same way it does if at some point in history England had not become such a powerhouse. The British East India Company was a modern, groundbreaking power, but at the same time it was a vision. A vision of how to create a great power from scratch. A vision that whoever does not grow is going backwards. They exported that vision to the rest of the world. And that vision is still with us today. The British East India Company is the cornerstone on which the modern world order was built. My dear friends, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with your friends. And I will see you on the next adventure.